welcome to everybody from around the world. Uh, we have been looking at the chat room this morning and you guys are all over the place. But welcome to this MVA Jumpstart on the Modern Web Platform. We're gonna have a really good time today. We are, we're here for six modules for some really interesting content. And I'm back in the studio with my good friend, Michael Palermo. How you doing? I'm doing good. Why don't you tell everybody, basically, who are you? Well, as uh, he said, Michael Palermo, that's my name. My uh, tenure with Microsoft so far has been about four years. I've really enjoyed that as a developer evangelist. And my focus as of right now is really all things web, especially cross-platform. That's really kind of exciting to me. I, I'm really getting into some hardcore JavaScript. Some of the things we're going to be talking about today, I'm really excited about because of some libraries and frameworks that are available to be used. I, I love gaming. Uh, you'll often see on my uh, blog at Palermo4.com that I like to talk about Game Maker and other gaming uh, engines. And of course, we did the gaming engines with the Microsoft Virtual Academy a while back, and that has been an amazing experience as well as for some viewers. And uh, really, the bottom line is, uh, if you want to find out more about me and what I'm going to be up to very soon, you should check out my blog at Palermo4.com. Having said that, it's back to Jeremy Foster. All right, yeah, that's me, Jeremy Foster. You can find me online at codefoster.com, on Twitter, at codefoster. Recommend you follow us because sometimes Michael and I have got some uh, events in our area. Sometimes we've got some, some uh, new stuff on the platforms, whatever. So follow us on Twitter, that'd be good. But uh, basically, I, yeah, I'm just like Michael, I'm a developer evangelist at Microsoft, love my job, love talking about code almost more than coding itself. Uh, I'm, I'm really honing in on web platform, Windows apps, and loving cloud computing these days. There's all kinds of cool stuff in the cloud. I do all my blogging at codefoster.com, so you can follow me there. And uh, also, I've got a couple of things, little projects that I, I work on. One of them is called Code Chat, so you can go to codefoster.com slash code chat. It's basically a podcast, a video podcast, an audio podcast, and you can, uh, you can subscribe to that and get some shows. It's, a lot of uh, talking to Microsoft program managers and developers in the community, people like yourself that are making apps, making sites and apps with, uh, well, sometimes Microsoft technologies, sometimes all kinds of other technologies as well. Also, uh, the app called Code Show that you're going to be hearing a lot about in this course and uh, the, our next course. So, Code Show is an app that's, uh, it does, it basically makes it easy to do a lot of little tiny uh, features in web apps and in uh, Windows using HTML and JavaScript. So you get to not only see the demo, but see the code. So we'll talk more about that later. That's me, Jeremy, and Michael, and here we go. Happy to be here. I guess we should talk about what we're going to be talking about today, Michael. Sure. So first of all, just to make sure that the expectations are set and you guys are in the uh, course that you're expecting and we're talking about the things that, uh, that you're expecting, uh, we're expecting that you are anywhere from a beginner to an intermediate web platform experience. If you're advanced, I don't think you'll be bored. I think we're going to have a good time. Um, but this is kind of what we're targeting. We're, we also are looking for people who maybe you've been involved in the web platform for quite a while, but you're kind of looking for what's the latest, what's, you know, what's really happening in the web platform, and how are we using that, specifically in Windows apps, but also you know, in all kinds of other areas. And I think this could also include developers that are good developers, but they've just never done web stuff before. And so, especially the first thing we're going to be doing this morning could be a nice little primer for them as well. They've got the development skills. Now they just want to see how to apply that to the web world. So that would be a target audience too. Yeah. You're going to find a lot of courses on MicrosoftVirtualAcademy.com that are kind of supporting. So if you need to go back and do a beginner course on HTML, you'll find that. If you want to find some other lateral technologies and, and features, you'll find those on, virtual, on MicrosoftVirtualAcademy.com. There's also a couple of other sites that, uh, that I've got as references for you that I enjoy for uh, learning the basics of the web platform. One is CodeAcademy.com, and the other one is Code.org slash learn. These are both really good, really helpful for um, just getting the basics. So that's, if that's where you're at and you're kind of feeling a little bit lost, feel free to uh, jump into those. 
Now, the MVA, the Microsoft Virtual Academy that you're tuned into right now is a really cool community. It's a really cool effort in my opinion. I think it's got some really great stuff to offer. It's got a lot of developer courses, a lot of IT pro courses. Uh, this says that there are a million registered users, but I think there's a lot more than that now. I think there my slide is. is old. I think it's old too. And when I walked into the building, I saw a nice little poster that said over two million. <laughs> So uh, you're part of that community, and we'd like to see you continue to be part of that community. You should register. You should really take a look at the offers. I, I think that offer right there is pretty attractive. The, the one with the uh, 50 MBA points for this event and, and the voucher. Yeah. Yeah, basically you tune into this and you get some extra points. That's one of the cool things about Microsoft Virtual Academy is that there's this whole gamification of learning that's involved where yeah. you actually uh, you get points, you get to watch your points accrue, and you get to beat your friends. That's really, that's the, that's the bottom, that's the bottom line, line, right? You get right. to beat your friends, yeah. yeah. So get 50 points and, and uh, work your way toward beating your friends by going to this aka.ms link. Use that code. And, um, and get yourself 50 points. There you go. Now, the topics for today. Remember, we're going to be doing this in six modules, and here they are. The first module, an introduction and primer. Michael, you're going to be leading that one. Why don't you tell us what we're, what we're thinking with this first module? So for those who are intermediate or maybe even advanced with the web, they might think this is a little slow, and that's understandable. But this is perfect for those who feel like I'm a little weak in some of the uh, web syntax, whether it's HTML or CSS or JavaScript, this will at least get you started, even conceptually, with some of the things that we're going to be talking about. And then later on throughout the day, of course, it'll get a little deeper. But this is just perfect for those who want to get that conceptual thing going. You know those highway on-ramps where you have a hard time merging because the traffic's moving so fast? That's what this is. It's a quick on-ramp. Yeah. You're going to have to jump into the stream. Uh, you're going to have to punch it. You're going to have to hit the gas there. Yeah. All right, module two, we're going to be talking about layout and styling. Basically, we're going to be talking about CSS. Module three, give us a little prime, a little intro to that. Same, same thing. We're going to still be in CSS. We're just going to, instead of talking about the structure of the, how things are placed on the screen, we're going to talk about some cool animation and techniques that you can do uh, to torque the things that are going to be on the screen. In module four, we're going to be talking about the core APIs. What we've done here is we've kind of broken this out into a number of modern APIs that are, that are in the web platform. It's, you hear it called HTML5. Really, a lot of these APIs you're accessing through JavaScript. So don't be confused. HTML5 is a little bit of an umbrella uh, term. So in HTML and JavaScript, in the web platform, you're going to find a lot of different APIs. We've broken these into the core APIs and then some UI APIs for module 5. Okay, So just a, a smattering of topics there. And we can't cover them all, but we're pulling out the ones that we know, love, and feel like you'll benefit from, uh, from being introduced reduced to. And then in six, what's six? Six is about the libraries, and you really couldn't have a discussion about the modern web platform if you didn't include those, because we're, we're almost dependent now on some of these libraries so we can be more efficient, more productive. So we're going to, if you haven't heard of some of these before, you're going to have an opportunity to find out what these libraries do and which ones might uh, be very well suited for your needs. And what we're going to try to do is position those for you. So maybe you've heard the popular libraries and you're like, what's, what's that one for? When would I use that? Why would I use it? How does it compare to the others? And so we'll give you a little bit of, uh, little bit of a reference there. That's the course topics for the day. That's not too hard. And Michael, why don't you just bring us right into the introduction and primer module. OK, I'm there. So we are going to get started with how you can get quickly ramped up in the limited time we have left in this module. So uh, here we go. The basics are going to be, first of all, putting it right back on you, Jeremy, <laughs> because it's an introduction That's to Code right. Show. That's right. I'm going to do an introduction to Code Show. Now, uh, I, I debated actually introducing Code Show here, but I, th I think it's important for you to at least know about it now. We won't use Code Show quite as much in this course because we're talking about the web in general. And so a lot of the things that we do are, uh, we'll, we'll, you ha we'll use other means to show you your demos. But what we really want to do is we want to send you home with all of the code that we talk about online here. And so that's what the, the point of Code Show is. If you download the Code Show app, you get this huge collection of demos. And for any of those demos, um, even if you don't have Visual Studio and your, your machine all set up as a developer, for any of these demos that you see on the screen, you click it and you get to not only watch the demo, but you get to see the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript behind it. So what you need to do here is if you, if you want 
the app itself and the ability to see the demo and see the code, you go to aka.ms slash code show app and you can just download. You can also just go to the Windows Store and do a search for code show and you're going to find it. If, if you're kind of a geek like me and you want the real code, you want the, the solution in, in uh, Visual Studio, then you go to codeshow.codeplex.com and you'll find the entire source code. You can fork it, you can clone it. It works exactly like GitHub for the most part, and you're, you're a developer on the project. We actually really love getting contributions from the community. And so if, you, if, I, if I launch Code Show here um, on my machine and I scroll over, oops, that one closed it. That one's not gonna work, but that's okay. But if you launch Code Show on your machine, you'll see that on the front page, there's a section for all of the demos. And then there's also a, sh a section for uh, contributors. And those are folks like you that have contributed to the project. As a matter of fact, some of the demos that we show in these courses this week are going to be courses, uh, demos that have been contributed from the community. So that's Code Show. That's awesome. Very cool. So now what we're going to do is focus on some of the fundamentals. We, we broke it down into three major categories. You could say it's source for HTML, style for CSS, and script for the JavaScript stuff. So we're going to focus on our main source now, and that is the HTML fundamentals. And uh, to start that off, we're going to have a definition followed with a little bit of a syntax, and I'm also going to talk about some of uh, the new standards that have been out, and Jeremy's going to talk a little bit about some uh, interesting user agent browser stuff. But let's talk about the definition first. So HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and I thought for those who might be just absolutely brand new and you've never even done this before, I just want you to consider this text. Hello, I am Michael. That's just pure text. But now let's say we bring a browser into play, and what the browser will do is take text in an HTML document, parse it, and then display it. So if you put this raw text into a browser, guess what? It's going to show exactly the way we put it because there's nothing hyper, there's nothing marked up about it, it's just raw text. Although, if I put a carriage return after the word hello, you'll notice that the browser stays the same. And the reason for that is because the markup language is going to start to control the structure of how things are going to be displayed. So if I wanted to change that behavior and use HTML, then I would need to start introducing the markup. So in this example, if I now put hello in what are called elements or tags, the paragraph tag, so there's an opening and closing paragraph tag on hello and also on I am Michael, then when that shows, you would see that those two would be on separate lines. Okay, if I add bold tags inside of the tag, so this is nesting elements or nesting a tag within a tag, so the bold tag's inside the paragraph tag, and inside the bold tag is hello, that will result in hello being bold. Then, it's not just about text, it's also about other things that can be displayed. So if I were to say I want to add an image to this particular uh, page, then of course the image tag, which is responsible for displaying images, could uh, point to or reference to a particular file, and then it would show. So that is a basic understanding of some of the very, very simple aspects of, of HTML. There's tags. Uh, you can see inside the image tag, there's an attribute, an SRC attribute that says, okay, here's the file I'm pointing to. Uh, very fundamental HTML. Now, I think we all would agree that five is greater than four. It, I agree. I agree, yes. But how is it that that also means that five is less than four? That's kind of crazy. Yeah, I disagree. <laughs> I think you'll change your mind. Ah. See, when HTML5 came out, of course, it was the next version, which is greater than 4. But when HTML5 came out, we found out that it was really less than its predecessors. How would it be less? Let's take a look. So this was what we used to have to do. We would have to type all this nonsense just to put a few things onto the page. In fact, in this example, it only shows one word, which is crazy. So the doc type declaration, which is the very first thing at the top, says this is the kind of HTML document I am. Starting with HTML5, that got reduced to that. Whew, that's much less. Better. So we can move everything else up and 
Now we can say, well, if we just simply want to say this HTML document is going to target English language, we can now do this. That's much better. If I just want to say what the character set is going to be used the, the, for uh, this particular uh, HTML document, that's all I have to do. I can move everything up again. Even the link, do I need to specify it's a style sheet and then also say what its type is? No. No. No longer. No. So we, that's all we have to do now. So when it's all said and done, you know, giddy up. It's, it's less. Excellent. You know, five is less than four. That's how that's possible. It's so much uh, leaner. It's better. But, you know, while we're on that topic, I, I do want to mention this. We have been saying HTML5 quite a bit. In fact, one of our first MVA uh, sessions we did together was on HTML5. But you'll notice now that the industry in general, including ourselves and those who are, are well-versed in the web industry, we're just saying HTML. We're not really saying HTML5. We're not having to say CSS3. You know, we're just saying HTML and CSS. So if we just reference it, we're just talking about the latest version. OK, let's talk about something else with regard to HTML uh, content. And when you look at the screen, what you're going to notice here is this is kind of a logical organization of an HTML document. It's, you know, it's kind of a higher level view, so it's not exact text. But it, you, can, you can guess what's going on here. We're using what's called a div, a div tag to say, here's the top, the header, and now we're going to have some navigation underneath that. We're going to have an article over to one side. We're going to have a sidebar and a footer. We did that so much that, voila, we now have these tags. So that was part of the newer um, addition of some elements that were added when HTML5 did come out. Now, check out this recent user agent distribution for, from a blog post, not that I did, but, but that, that Jeremy did. did. Yeah, actually, what are you talking about? Yeah, I actually just had some analytics that I thought were interesting here. This was a, a recent blog post. I looked at the browser, the user, a user agent is a browser. And I looked at the user agent distribution for this blog post, and this is what it looks like. That looks like it looks like uh, almost exactly equal slices of pie there. And I'm just using this to reinforce that we are living in a multi-browser world. There are all kinds of user agents. There are desktop and mobile versions of them. There's a different user agent for every platform. And then for any platform, you can actually download probably three or four or five different browsers, whatever you want to use. And so this is a pain that we have to live with in the web world. And it's getting easier all the time. It's not that bad now. Um, but you really do have to consider the fact that your code is going to be open on a lot of browsers. Now, when we're talking about HTML in general, that's the case. As we get into our, our next course later this week, you're, you'll see that we're going to be narrowing our, our platform. We know what to expect. We know what our users are, are using whenever they're using uh, Windows 8 to run your app. But in this case, it could be any browser. So keep that in mind. Yeah, very important. So thank you for sharing that. And really, it does uh, highlight the fact that the same HTML that we we just put together, let's say, for those of you very new to web and, you, and you're looking at those tags, it's that same HTML that's going to get parsed in all these different browsers. And so we, we have to start worrying about all of that, including what we're going to be talking about next. And that is the CSS fundamentals. So let's also talk about what the definition would be and a little bit of the syntax. So when we're talking about CSS, we're talking about cascading style sheets. And that means, yes, HTML can be part of the story with regard to what's in the source. But if we want to start to adding the style definitions outside of that HTML and outside of those angle brackets, we can start to introduce them like this. So let's, let's imagine here we have these three divs. Right now, the first div is just plain. The second one has an ID that equals 1. And the third div has a uh, class that equals many. These are two attributes that you would put into the HTML uh, elements. Right now, if we were to parse this as is in a browser, it would probably look something similar to like what's in the box. Nothing different about any of them. So the ID and the class have not changed anything in this example? Nothing at all. Okay. It's, it's metadata that's beneficial to something or someone, but currently it's not benefiting anyone. So let's see how it would. Let's start to talk about 
what if we were to say in CSS, and this is an example of the syntax, that for all div elements that exist on this page, let's now change its font weight to bold. So if that goes into effect, of course, then all divs, no matter what's in them, they're going to be bold. Does that seem simple? That seems simple. That seems simple. Now, another thing CSS lets us do, and this is an example of a selector where now we're using a hashtag one, and that hashtag really means ID. And the reason why I used one as the ID is, well, there can only be one. <laughs> and I won't quote that from anything. I'm just saying there can only be one on that page. And so when you're thinking about IDs, you don't use the same name IDs everywhere on your HTML document. There should only be one existence of that on that page. So that was a reminder for the viewers out there, only use one. Going back to our example here. So we have uh, hashtag one. And so what that means in CSS is I'm going to find that one no matter what it is, whether it's a div or a span or a paragraph. I don't care what it is. Let's just change its color to red. And then voila, of course, it's going to change to red. Then we can also introduce another syntax, and that's that dot many. And of course, I use the term many because you can have many of those on one page. I could use that class equals many on anything. It doesn't have to be a div. It can be a paragraph. It can be an anchor tag. It can be whatever I want to assign it to. And if I apply that, then of course, that's awesome because it applies both the bold from the div above and also the italics, just as the uh, one that uh, pointed to color red also merged those two things together. So that's just a very simple, easy uh, explanation of how you can start to apply styles. Now, in the example that you saw, I'm just showing you the high-level overview. We, we weren't looking at how, you know, what files everything's in, or how, could it be on the same page? Could it be on a different page? And the answer to that, of course, is yes, it could be either merged together or in separate files. <laughs> the, the key thing here to uh, think about is that it's a common practice to keep your style definitions outside of the source HTML document because it allows developers to apply different styling techniques based on what we talked about earlier, the different types of browsers that are out there, or, or now we're, we're starting to even think in terms of the different kind of devices or the different kind of uh, orientations or screen sizes. So putting those style definitions out there, we're trying, you know, the, the big win is if we can have the HTML stay as, as simple as possible with content in it and allow the CSS that, that would apply or adapt to any one of these situations to come into play. So that's, that's the key here is separating style from your HTML. And of course, you can dynamically determine what style you would use, or there can be other factors that Jeremy's probably going to get into in the next module that will show you how you can start to adapt to those things. Now that takes us to our JavaScript fundamentals. And when thinking in terms of JavaScript and also uh, considering the fundamentals here, it, you know, what a daunting task. If you think about this, this is about describing an entire language in about 20 minutes or so, and that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> we won't cover it all in this. In, primer, fact, right? in fact, so much so that I limited how much I was actually going to put into the actual presentation without it getting to the point where it's like there's so many other areas I could have gone to. So I wanted to put it more as a discussion, uh, more of a, a talk at, at one level to say, first of all, in fact, if we go ahead and look, you could read this on the screen for a moment. And while you're letting that digest, I'm going to paraphrase a few things or, or talk about a few things. It is not an object-oriented language. It is an object-based scripting language. It's very similar to C. It uses a lot of the similar syntax that a lot of C developers have used. It's powerful. It's been around a long time. It's been around longer than a lot of popular languages today. It uses uh, 
it uses different features that allow for mathematical expressions. It has uh, certain intrinsic data types that it uses, and yet at the same time, it's a very dynamic and, and uh, very easy to get confused with, I have a variable and I don't remember what type it is, and there's no compiling that happens where you, you end up using your compiled code. It's all scripted and happening on the fly. So that is one of the reasons why some developers have said, you know, I don't know if I want to go with JavaScript. I'm going to go with a language that's compiled, you know, because I'll get the benefits. And there is a benefit to compiled languages. I mean, right off the bat, if it's compiled, that means it obviously met some checks and said, okay, it's compiled. It's good. All, all the things you said here in terms of uh, data types, they were used appropriately. Uh, we compiled to that effect. With JavaScript, we have to do a lot more trusting of the developer, which is a very scary thing to do. So we have to write JavaScript code in such a way that we're protecting ourselves from ourselves. And so that, there's that added challenge when you're writing JavaScript. So I do want to show you how to do JavaScript, uh, some of the uh, basics of it. But I also don't want to overwhelm the audience either. If you're new to this, then you'll, you'll get thrown into uh, you know, a coding session at some point where you're going to have to learn it on your own. But I do want to go ahead and start thinking about the demos. And this is an opportunity for me to also talk about how I decided to use some of the demos today. And that is by using a website that allowed me to publish the demos out there. They're live, so you can actually go there and experiment with these demos if you want to. You can add on, you can subtract, so you can go and play there. It's like a playground if you uh, want to think of it that way. It's appropriately named. It's called CodePen. So at this CodePen that I'm going to be going to, you can get there by the link that was uh, showing on the screen. That'll actually take you to my website, and then you just click on the first pen uh, that shows there. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, transfer over right now. and go to the fundamentals of JavaScript demo for the, micro, or for the uh, yeah, Microsoft Virtual Academy. So I'm going to click on that one. And I'm going to set the scene here. And I'll minimize the CSS so we're just focused on the HTML and the JavaScript. First of all, for those of you that may be uh, extraordinarily new to HTML, this whole thing that we're seeing here would not be considered a complete HTML document. One of the nice things about CodePen is they allow you to just focus on what would be the insides of the body tag. So uh, the document has structure, as we showed earlier when we were talking about all the things that the older versions had to do, and now it's a leaner document. But, but this is an opportunity for us to say, OK, if we had all that metadata surrounding us, what, what else would we need? Just the body stuff, just the stuff that actually shows on the page. So what we have here is a button. The button has an ID. We have a horizontal rule, which is on line two, which will cause a line to go all the way across the screen. And then we have a div or division tag, which means I'm going to divide the page right here into a region that's going to have content. And right now, that would be known as an empty element or empty tag because there's nothing inside of this div. And when I'm saying that, I'm referring to uh, Inside meaning right here. There's nothing inside there. It's just an open and close tag. That's it. So that's the HTML side. Now, if we want to go take a look over at the JavaScript side, I'm just going to scooch this down. This also plays the same way. In other words, everything that you're seeing on the screen right now would be inside of a script tag, but this website automatically puts the functions and these uh, code statements into a script tag for me. So just giving you that heads up so you're not thinking that this is the only thing that you have to do. The function that is declared here on line one is one that I created by myself. I'm the one who chose this name. I said, I'm going to create a function called button handler. And inside of this function, that will take no arguments. So that's why the parentheses are empty here. Otherwise, there's a way for you to pass in information into the function when you call it. But right now, I'm keeping it simple. This tag right here is, or not the tag, but this uh, brace, this curly brace, is the beginning of a block of statements of code. So it's saying, the function will begin now. Then I'm declaring a variable called content. The content variable 
is going to contain what's inside of this content ID because we said go to the document and get the element by ID and it's called content. So if we want to look back over, we could say, oh, it must be talking about this guy because that's the thing that has an ID with content. So what we're saying is this variable of content is going to represent this entire div. And that's how we can reference it. So content is representing the div. And now what will I do with this variable? I'm using one of its properties. Now this is part of what's called the DOM, the document object model, which means that all the elements that are in HTML, when they're loaded up in JavaScript land, the JavaScript land can now start using those elements as objects with properties on them. So I'm saying, let me go to that div tag that has an ID of content. Let me change its inner HTML. Remember, there's nothing in it right now. And let me add a header one tag that has inside of it JS. So that's all the button will do. Now here's the thing for you first time JavaScripters, if you create this function, which I've just done, and that's all you did, nothing is going to work. <laughs> because a function is a declaration of a behavior, but until something invokes that function, it's worthless. So down below, I've created another variable this variable is pointing to the thing that has an ID of btn click me. Well, that would be the button up here. Once that button object is available to me inside of that variable, I am now saying, if this thing ever gets clicked, which was what the on click is, if it ever gets clicked, I want to point it to this function to handle it. In other words, clicking the button calls this function. That's why I called it button handler, because the button handler function will handle the button when it gets clicked. Kind of makes sense. So let's see if it works. <coughs> What's nice about CodePen, for those of you who are watching and never seen it before, is you get this live preview down here. So this is actually the document running. If I say click me, I get the JS to appear down below in that header one tag. Very simple to use. Now I'm going to go back to uh, the MVA Modern Web Platform collection I created, which has a whole bunch of samples that you're going to be uh, seeing today. I'm going to also show you that what you saw before was not just uh, PowerPoint slides. They were actually derived from code. So the three divs that we had where we have the ID of one and the class of many. Now we can see the cascading style sheet uh, definitions come into play. So all of these here are what result in this. If I wanted to change that color to blue instead, all I'd have to do is type that, and you could see down below it took effect immediately. I'm highlighting that because if you're watching and you're following along, if you got to this codepen.io slash Palermo 4, and you want to make your own changes so you could prove some concepts to yourself, I would highly suggest you do that. Start experimenting. This is the way you can start to learn all of this cool stuff. And what's really nice about this is that the CodePen uh, site allows for the developers to tag things and to put them in collections. So maybe after you're comfortable with some of the basics, you can start to explore what other members of the community have done and to showcase other things that you can accomplish with these fundamental things. So I will definitely be getting back to uh, CodePen uh, throughout the day in order to showcase some of the, the basics of uh, or the fundamentals of web stuff. I do also want to uh, go back to the, before I leave CodePen, I'm going to go back over to, whoops, stay on this page. I went the wrong way. Go this way. Oh, stay on this page. What am I doing wrong? I'm going to say, yes, leave this page. <laughs> it's saying, do you want to leave? Yes, I actually do want to leave. OK, so I'm going to go back inside here. And there is another one that I wanted to uh, show you. And that was this very first one. So 
The reason why I'm showing you the very first one that was even talked about, the, the HTML source, is because on the PowerPoint slide, I didn't have an opportunity to fit this in. Uh, I just wanted to find a long link to some image file to showcase that when you're in your source code, you have the ability to reach out to the world uh, with your source tags. And, and there's a couple other elements that feature this as well, where you can indicate that there's going to be an external source loaded into your page. So I'm not the one who owns that, that uh, graphic. That, that was found on <laughs> uh, wiki, wikimedia.org. You know, but you could, you could highlight any particular uh, file. You could get it from your own web server. You can get it from another web server. So this is an example of the HTTP protocol saying, OK, I'm going to go all the way to this file because it's a known one and add it there onto the screen. And what happens if that URL, what happens if the whoever owns that changes? So that's a great question. Let's say, for example, that I'm going to go in here and change right now this to be uh, you know, something that probably does not work. Hmm. You'll notice immediately in the preview, it, it automatically detected, oops, and it put this little thing, uh, this little like box. How every browser handles that, however, is going to be different. Some browsers will put a little placeholder like we just saw on the screen. Uh, others might just have this strange empty space. I, I don't know, have you seen anything else different as, as far as what happens if you ask for something and it's not there? I do think there's an option where you can tell it that you want there to be a placeholder that's the size of the image, and then I believe it's just gray and it actually saves the space on the page, sometimes makes the page render more accurately even though the images are broken, but yeah. Yeah. So that's what would happen. And so, but the good news about talking about this is that you'll understand that it could change, not because someone did this in your code, but literally they took it down. It's no longer on the server. So you have to start thinking about dependencies on external things. Yikes. You better, better be careful and have a lot of trust. And as you'll learn throughout the course, and uh, even if you stick around uh, for the one we're going to be doing later, you're going to see there's things that you could do in order to help you to make sure that you're not going to be uh, stranding a user with looking at something that looks incomplete. Yeah. And also know that if you have a website and you're publishing, say, an article with a link to a, a, an image, and that image is showing up in your article, anybody else on the entire interweb could get the URL for that image and, and reproduce that on their site, link directly to your image. Some people try to say, please don't do that. You know, but really, if you have it out there, it's, it's fair game for anybody to grab. And so if all of a sudden their site gets really popular, it, you could get just that, that one uh, resource slammed um, from their traffic. Absolutely. So this is going to be one more demo that I'm going to show that I'm also going to highlight later. But the, the reason why I'm showing it right now is because I want you to see what the JavaScript could end up looking like. And it, it can get uh, pretty lengthy. And it can look pretty complicated. So this is an example of a WebGL JavaScript that is controlling how uh, something is going to be drawn to a Canvas element on the, on the page. So you could see that JavaScript can get, if it wants to, pretty intense. Even that init function that you see here on the screen understands that there could even be some errors thrown. And so it's trying to do a good job at saying, well, let me try to do this draw here. And if that should fail, let me catch whatever that error message is. So that's what E represents. And then I'll do an alert to the user that says, we have an error. And it's this thingy. And so whatever that would convert to a string message, that's what's going to show. So that's a nice idea to do if you really think there's a possibility that something could go wrong. Just another example of some syntax with regard to JavaScript for, for the newbies out there. Uh, definitely understand that this could be pages upon pages. And so you want to do a good job at making sure that you structure things just right. You, you use functions and call them accordingly. This is an example of a function that's going to have three arguments in it that are passed in when it's invoked. And you know, you can be writing your own functions this way, or you might be using other functions that were already created for you. So either way it goes, this is how you start to embrace it. It's a very function-oriented language. 
And I think it might be helpful to point out explicitly at this point that when you look at HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, especially if you're new to them, you might notice that not everything makes total sense. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we had somebody asking about the div tag. What is the div tag? And uh, there are a lot of there's a lot of nomenclature in the web stack that is archaic. That there's a reason why it was that way, and now it can't really change because everybody's and all the browsers are expecting it to be exactly that way. And it's really because this web stack is is uh, I guess <laughs> you could call it mature. It's been around yeah. for something like 20 years or more, and um, it's been evolving. It's very democratic. There are a lot of people involved in contributions to the standards, and you'll notice that. Just don't get frustrated by it when you're new to the web stack because that's just the way it is. And actually, after a little while, it really starts to make some sense. And, and I mean, I still run into frustrations where I just, you know, throw the laptop out the window and say, I hate JavaScript. But uh, the next day, I'm always back to it. So, As his shirt implies. <laughs> so uh, that's very good information that Jeremy brought out because it can be very overwhelming. It used to be once upon a time, very early on in the web days, you were just focused on HTML. I mean, that's pretty much all you worried about. And then we got these cascading style sheets and we got the JavaScript. So we started to add, like to be a web developer means you really need to be in all of these things. And that can be overwhelming. But just know that because of its maturity, you also have some of the best documentation on the planet out there on the web because everybody's probably run into the very question that you've had. And if you go out and bing that question, you're probably going to find that somebody has already asked that question. And you might be surprised with how many responses you're going to get, especially with this. Over all other languages, you're going to get more support for what we're talking about today than anything else. Can I show everybody my code pen? Please. Um, so it, I have a code pen as well. It's pretty easy to uh, find the link. It's codepen.io slash codefoster. I've got a few things up there from uh, previous courses. And one that I wanted to show you real quick is, uh, is this one here. It's, it's basically a bit of HTML, a bit of CSS, and a bit of JavaScript. And I apologize, I don't have my, my font. I'll, I'll increase that here in a little while. But um, And if you look at the actual example, it's pretty neat. This, in this web stack, we now have, it, it's come into the modern world where the browsers are really intelligent. Michael's going to be showing you some 3D stuff here in a little while. It's amazing to see some of the stuff that the browsers are doing. And just this one, this was a really simple demo. It's actually not very much code. And you can see that I'm able to, I'm using touch here on this screen, and I'm able to just dynamically change the number of elements that are drawn and the size of those elements. And if you've been in the web stack for a little while, what you might be thinking here is that this is a float scenario. And it might make, it might make the hair on the back of your neck stand up because nobody likes float. It's, it's awful. Float is, uh, it has, to be, has to be turned on and then turned off and managed, and it's just ugly. I just, I've always hated float. This is actually a flex box. It's a modern standard for layout, and we'll look at it a bit later. And, and all of this rendering is, is happening with the, uh, the CSS engine in this browser. In this case, I'm using the, uh, the modern version of, of IE. And you see that it's just a real fluid experience. It all, it's supporting touch natively. And as we get into richer and richer experiences, in fact, in the next module, I'm going to be talking about uh, a website that Microsoft has called IE Test Drive, where you get to see a lot of really impressive demos that show off and actually kind of push the boundaries of what modern browsers can do. So as you look at this language stack, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, when you do the simple things, it kind of looks and feels a bit archaic, but it's also very modern as well. So it's a broad spectrum. It really does enable you in a lot of different ways with things like the 3D, the canvas, and all of the rich transition and, and transformation functionality that's in uh, CSS. I feel, I think that you're going to feel enabled by this platform. I agree. And so here's the challenge. In this module, what we had to do was talk about all of these things, HTML, JavaScript, cascading style sheets, put it in less than an hour and say, all right, there you go. And of course, we knew going into that that for some who are extraordinarily new, they're not going to get it all. So we wanted to at least provide some of the basics. Uh, show a little bit of the small syntax, but also cover some of the concepts. And even if right now, I'll challenge you, if some of you who are watching, because we know Jeremy and I both got uh, tweets from uh, people all around the world saying, I'm very new to this stuff. Am I going to survive? And we said, 
hang on, module one, and then as the day goes on, even if you're still feeling a little lost, what you'll start to see is some things will start to connect a little bit more. So we hope you stick around. Uh, in summary, what we did is we talked about the basics of the course. We've talked about the fundamentals of, uh, you know, the three major technologies, and we've introduced Coach O and CodePen. So uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, a break, and we'll take a, a small 10-minute break, and we'll be back, and Jeremy's going to discuss our next topic on style layout, and layout. Layout and style. Should be fun. See you soon. Thank you.